Um, we do loads and loads of work with LGBT families through all routes to parenthood, including fostering. And um, this is just a bit of what we do. So we have monthly get togethers, we've got a youth group, we've got parent socials, we've got a proud group for single um, LGBT parents and carers. Um, and we have me midweek meetups and parent support sessions. So that's us in a nutshell. I could speak to you all day about what we do at Proud to be Parents, but I know it's only really relevant to those that are based in the Northwest. If you are in the Northwest, do check us out. Again, you'll get a link to the website after, after you've got the set the training slides. Um, and yeah, you can link your foster carers up with us. That would be a really valuable thing to do. Okay, so what will we be, will we be getting through in the next hour and 20 minutes? Feels like a lot. Um, and I hope that you don't feel overwhelmed by it. But we will be really doing a deep dive into expanding and exploring the concept of identity and language and terminology. We want you to go away feeling a bit more confident about using the phrases that LGBT community use um, so that you can do better in supporting them and recruiting foster carers. Uh, and most importantly, we want you to, to get that basically sow that seed of confidence within you so that you can go away and think, wow, that really just made me think a little bit wider about the LGBT experience. I want to know more. Um, and we're this isn't the, the first session that we'll be delivering with Cora and Bath. We're hoping to do more in the future around and building on different topics because we can't all be experts in the field of LGBT inclusion by attending an hour and a half webinar. But what we can do is to, just to sow that seed about, right, we're gonna go away and we're gonna continue the learning and that's what we want to do today. So just a, a bit of uh, info about data. I'm, I'm a big fan of data um, because it, tell, it gives you a good picture about the community that you're serving. Um, and I think it's a real travesty that nationally we don't have any data um, on how many LGBT foster carers that we have. Um, we do have data on the amount of LGB plus people who have adopted, and we've got no stats on the amount of trans adopters, and we've got no stats on the amount of bisexual um, adopters either because they categorise it into same-sex relationships. So there's a real lack of inclusion in terms of the data that we collect for adoption, um, but we don't collect any data in fostering. Now, I've looked at the attendee list. We've got a real mix of people attending today from, you know, social work managers to in independent agencies. We've got loads and loads of experience here. Um, and one thing you could go away with and think about is how you collect data in your own organisations. Are you aware about how many LGBT foster carers that you have? Um, and are you, are you specifically putting out recruitment strategies that target that, that particular community group? Most importantly, are you using... Are you, utilizing that co-production of asking your LGBT foster carers that you already work with to support you in making sure that it's it's that's going to be the right recruitment strategy or this page that you've written for the website is inclusive. Utilize the community that you've got because most of the time they're really happy to support um, the work that you do in around inclusion. That's just a bit about data. Okay, so um, we're going to dive straight into terminology and language. Now, I, I don't, as I said before, I don't know anything about your understanding of, of the LGBT community. Um, some of you might be really clued up with these terms, others may not be so much. So what I'm going to do is go through these terms and give you the definitions and just give you a little bit of background about the terms and in some areas, give you a bit of lived experience about the experiences of the fostering community. Again, if at any point you've got any questions, because some of these terms, you might think, oh, should we be saying that? Throw those in the chat box. And again, we'll come back to those at the end in our Q&A session. OK, so we've got the first one here. We've got asexual, which is someone who has little or no um, sexual attraction. This is the asexual pride flag. Um, often people come away from these sessions and they recognise the the flags that I've put on put on this slide, and they think, "Oh, it's not a it's not a flag I'd seen before," because people are used to just seeing the rainbow flag, for example. Now, there's massive misconceptions around asexual people, and the grounded in stereotypes, which we know are harmful generalisations of commute of particular groups of people. 
Um, so often people misconstrue and think that asexual people will not become a family or will not have children or will not want those types of relationships in their life. And that's a misconception and a stereotype that I'd like you to, to pick away and kind of leave at the door when you carry on your practice from today onwards. Asexual people can and do form relationships um, and also may wish to have children and have roots to family lives, including fostering. So what we wouldn't want to do is, you know, an asexual person to write their sexual orientation on a form and instantly, you know, having an assessing social worker allocated with those misconceptions around asexual people. Um, we want true inclusion when we're working with asexual people. Often asexual people might refer to themselves as ace, and uh, not to be confused with adverse childhood experiences in our field of work. Um, so ACE is um, just a, a shortened version, basically, but it's spelled A-C-E. There's lots of different variations on the term asexual as well, including aromantic. Um, and again, after this, you'll, you'll have a, a slide where you can link out to different resources and, and have a, a real good look through a, um, a detailed glossary of terms. So this next one here, we've got coming out. So coming out, often people think that it's an LGBT person telling you that they're gay or a trans person saying, right, I'm trans, here I am, I'm out. And that's true, but often people think that it's just a one-off, it's a one-time experience, when actually the LGBT community are constantly coming out. Um, I, I've just had a recent uh, example of being at my physio because I've, I've had a sore neck, um, and they looked at my ring and assumed that I've got a husband at home and he just said something just oh you've got a couple you've got an hour off from the kids his hobby got the kids um this afternoon and instantly I'm faced with okay right well I either come out now and have an awkward conversation about his lack of awareness of the LGBT community or I just kind of just don't say anything and just ignore you know ignore it um, or let him think that I'm straight, which I'm not. So th these situations happen all of the time. So it's basically a daily occurrence for the LGBT foster carers that you're working with or the potential LGBT foster carers that you'd like to recruit. It's a constant coming out journey. And that also will obviously impact the children who are fostered by LGBT families because they're part of the LGBT community by proxy. And, you know, they have these coming out journeys too. For example, my son um, was spoken to by the governor a few weeks ago because they had Ofsted in and they said, what are mum and dad called? Um, and the teacher looked shocked because the teachers really like oh, wanted to make sure that they, we were getting it right. Um, and he just said, I don't have a, a daddy. I've got two mummies and he owns it, but that's him, you know, having to come out um, in unexpected moments, in unexpected times. So coming out is a, a lifelong process, basically. And we'd like to get to a point where we don't need to come out, where people can just be themselves without the need to, to share that. This one here, I'm not trying to trick you out. It's not a new sexual orientation called Ally. It, this is Ally. This is the Ally um, flag. And lots of people get these if you wear lanyards, um, pin badges, or if you've got like a work bag where you can put a, a badge on. These are really, like I said, really useful tools to do. Um, like visible signs and symbols are so important. Um, and, and basically to be an ally is if you are not part of the marginalized group, you basically you're fighting for the rights of that group. Um, so I'm not black, but I read black literature. Um, and I go out and I'm vocal and I am really vocal about the rights of black people. Um, and I would say that I'm an ally to the black community. So it's really important that as, as members of the children's workforce, members of children, uh, children's social care, that we're allies to marginalized groups, um, that we seek out diverse voices, that we listen, um, you know, because to be truly inclusive, we've got to listen and we've got to have that voice fueling the engines of what we're doing. Otherwise, we're just kind of winging it. So that's that's allyship, so important. So the next one here, we've got the term queer. So this is a really, um, this is one to be used with caution because it has historical derogatory um, connotations. 
lots of people find it offensive within the LGBT community. It's really important to recognize that. I'm a proud queer woman. Um, I use the term in a really positive way. It's been reclaimed by the community. More and more, particularly younger um, adults coming through who are interested in fostering will be using the term queer to describe themselves and their identities. Um, it can be used to describe a sexual orientation. Some people use it to describe their gender, or, uh, gender identity. So there's loads of different ways in which people use this term, which can make it trickier to understand. But in a nutshell, if a, if a community member uses it to describe themselves, then that's okay. But just don't use it as a, oh, I think they're queer. Like that's not acceptable um, language. And um, what we should be using is the, the language that the community member uses to describe themselves. Okay, so approach with caution, but it's being positively reclaimed and that's okay. Okay, next we've got pansexual and this is the pansexual pride flag. This is often um, confused with the term bisexual. So we've got bisexual over here on the right hand side. I should have put them together because I always talk about these at the same time. And here we've got pansexual. So pansexual is someone who's attracted to people regardless of gender. And bisexual is someone who's attracted to people of their own gender and other genders. Often people confuse bisexuality as, oh, we're only attracted to men and women. And that's an incorrect definition. It's attraction to their own gender and other genders. Um, I can see a few confused looks and that's okay. This one is tricky. To, to understand and that is why we've linked you to a glossary with the slides and again like I said you don't have to be experts and go away and think oh that doesn't make any sense um the, the person who's using that term understands who they are and we should basically ultimately respect the terms that the community use to describe their own sexual orientation so that's pansexual attraction to people regardless of gender and bisexual attraction to people of their own gender and other genders. Okay, here we've got lesbian and gay, and these are usually two of the terms that people are, are really quite familiar with. So lesbian is to uh, a, a woman or femme presenting person attracted to other women, and, and gay is usually um, to men, um, or men attracted to other men. Um, and we've got the black and brown there, which is in including all of the different elements of the community there, including the black gay people and other minoritized groups within the gay community. It's really important that that representation is there and that inclusion is there. Um, moving on to this pride flag here. So this is a, an, an, a, in addition to the, the gay pride flag. Just a point on gay, sorry, because some women will use that to describe themselves as well. So I'll, I'll say that I'm a gay woman. Um, so it's really important to recognize that. So this one here is the all-inclusive um, pride flag. So it's got the pink, white, and blue colors there, which is inclusive of the trans community. I actually need to update this slide because there's, there is an, an, another variation on this flag, which has got the intersex colors on as well. And we'll talk about that definition in a moment. So if you're looking at spaces and think we need some more LGBT representation, um, I would recommend you get this one. You basically Google the all-inclusive pride flag and it will come top on Amazon or wherever it is you want to buy your stuff. Um, and yeah, I, I do recommend you get that. You could frame it, you could put your LGBT foster carers around it and your office spaces or whatever it is you want to do. It'd be a really nice thing to do. Okay, so this one here, heteronormativity, it's usually something, a term that is brand new to people. Um, it basically means that everyone's expected to grow up and be heterosexual. It's the way society is built. It's the gold standard way to be. And if you deviate from that in any which way, then you'll face barriers to inclusion in society. The society is heteronormative. Um, there's loads of examples and I'll, and I'll talk about those on the next slide. Um, but th things that some of the LGBT community are faced in fostering. Um, I mean, I was asked at panel, how did we decide who would take the leave? Um, because we're two women. 
And for me, that was a heteronormative question. It had no bearing on our caregiving capacity. It didn't provide panel with any information that was relevant to our caregiving capacity. It was panel's curiosity about how we as two women came to the decision to as to which one of us would um, be the be, be the person taking the leave. Um, and I did ask them, would you ask that? Have you had sexual couples? And they said no. And I said, well, that's something to go back and think about and reflect on. Um, because although it wasn't outwardly homophobic, I felt that it was an inappropriate question and not a valuable use of panels, experience and expertise, um, because it was just a, basically an over curiosity about how we live our lives as, as a lesbian couple. And I've got some more examples about heteronormativity in a moment. Um, and then finally here, we've got sexuality and sexual orientation. So sexual orientation is, is the term that we would want you to use if you're talking about someone's sexual orientation. We've put sexuality in here because often people might say their sexuality is gay or their sexuality is lesbian. And what we really want you to use is the phrase sexual orientation um, because they're slightly different, but they're often used as the same thing um, because sexuality can also mean how you express your sexual orientation um, so what we want yeah so basically is that you use the phrase sexual orientation when you're talking about someone's sexual orientation so here's some other examples of heteronormativity in practice so uh, referring to a person's partner as their friend so not saying oh their girlfriend their wife if it's two women or the, these are husbands um yeah, it's basically about people's people being uncomfortable about what language to use. And hopefully we've kind of dispelled those myths that you can you can use terms. It's OK. Um, banter. This is a really big one, especially in offices where people are, uh, you know, they're breaking. They're, they're talking about particular issues with certain children or with certain families they're, they're you know, social workers supporting each other. Oh, did you know you'd never know that they're. They're gay. Could you believe it? Charlotte looks really straight. You'd never expect her to be gay, would you? Or we've also had um, a foster carer go to panel and um, an assessing social worker when the couple were out of the room say, oh, I've not, they are gay, but I've not seen them be gay together. You, but you wouldn't know, would you? So this is like gossip and banter and, it, and it's, it's, it's actually homophobic, these, these microaggressions. Now, did you know they're gay? They don't seem gay picking up the phone. Can you believe, oh, we've got a gay, we've got another gay person, a diversity tick. So all of this banter is, is something that I want you to go away and reflect on. Does it happen in your spaces? Um, how can you support the workforce to be confident in challenging positively that kind of, of banter? So this over curiosity is, is also quite common. Um, so, for example, who wears the trousers? Who's the man woman in your relationship? We were asked basically who puts the bins out at home because they were expecting us to fit into the roles of man and woman in our relationship. Um, stereotyping. I love gay people boxing all LGBT people into one um, into one person, which removes that person centered approach that we're after. Do you like share? <laughs> Um, you know, I have another like you. And obviously we want to know that you're working with other LGBT families, but what that says is that you're expecting us to be just like that family and that removes that person-centered element. Um, another one is assuming LGBT people haven't had fertility difficulties. Um, it's really important still to ask that question. A lot of LGBT people may, may feel lost about not being able to create a child together. Um, they may have research surrogacy they may have um gone to a fertility clinic and that not being successful but to assume that they haven't particularly gay male couples coming through to assume that they haven't um you, you could be losing a whole part of your assessment there that, that needs to be worked through um because it, it may be that they have you know tried with a surrogate and that's not worked for example so we should never assume that LGBT people have, have not had fertility difficulties. Um, we also have, this is quite common as uh, two men where um, asking where will a child get a female influence in their lives? Um, and it's particularly more common a question for, two, for, for men rather than women. 
um, from the experiences that we've spoken to the, the, the community about. And that comes down to the stereotype around how can men care for girls? And that stereotype still exists within the social care sector. So it's important to recognize that. And, you know, if we've got any assessing social workers here, that's great to be taking that back and reflect on your practice, but also be thinking about how you can feed this back to your assessing social workers. Um, and then also getting the LGBT panel members to ask LGBT related questions. We, we also recognize that this happens quite frequently. Um, a lot of the members of Proud to be Parents may be on panel um, and they said that they always get asked to get, get asked to formulate the questions for the LGBT families and then that's more pressure on them um, and it, so it's important to, to look at that with panel about making sure that everybody has the opportunity to create questions um, yeah so it's, it's just something to be mindful about singling out your LGBT panel members as well so just because in terms of some more inclusive language, some inclusive language tips, again, you get all these, so I will be whizzing through them. So we shouldn't use the phrase homosexual. Um, again, it's got negative historical con connotations. It used to be illegal to be homosexual. That was the, the term used within the law until 1967. Um, um, so yeah, we don't use that. And again, here in, in the, the second one homosexual relations relationship we should just be saying that they're a couple or they're married they're in a relationship if you don't say they're straight married <laughs> we don't need to say they're gay married um and if we if you know if we feel the need to say they're in a same-sex relationship then you should be saying they're in a heterosexual relationship throughout your reporting as well to make it inclusive and equitable for all people um here we've got sexual preference gay lifestyle sexual identity, chosen lifestyle, all terms that we shouldn't be using. We should be using the phrase sexual orientation. This really, I'm looking at people reading form Fs, reading, um, you, you know, when you're writing up your supervisions, when you're writing up your annual reviews, but basically when you, you, you're writing about your LGBT families, be thinking about the language that you're using and use this as a guide basically. Um, here we've got another two that are around the term homosexuality, which I've already discussed. The bottom here we've got gay marriage, same-sex marriage. So of course we should be celebrating that. Um, but what we would prefer you to use is marriage. We don't need to put gay on the front of it. And again here, gay adoption, gay fostering, they're foster carers um, because we don't use the phrase straight fostering. Um, now, of course, we want to recruit more LGBT families. So on your recruitment strategy, your literature, you will be using the term LGBT and you will be picking out different terms. That's OK, because that's really important, targeted stuff. Um, but but to be writing it in reports and things like that, it's it, it's not relevant. We've got gay agenda, homosexual agenda. Oh, it's a big part of the gay agenda. You know, there's been the Qatar, the, currently the Qatar work. World Cup, everyone thinks that there's this big gay agenda that we want to take over the world and make everybody gay. That's not the case. Um, we just want basic the basic human rights um, that we have by law just to be carried out and enacted. And if there's anything in the media, um, you know, a, a gay kiss or a new lesbian couple on Coronation Street, there's uproar, there's complaints because we're trying to sexualize the whole country and that's just not the case we're just looking for fair representation because a lot of the community are lgbt a lot of the the country are lgbt should i say so here we've got some really offensive homophobic terms that we would never use and should never use um and then here we've got gay lesbian bisexual in caps we've seen this before in assessment forms where they've written they are gay or they are lesbian um, and these little things, a, an applicant might just breeze over. Because I remember looking at my PAR form thinking, is that there? Do I tell them about it? Because I can't be bothered. Because you constantly, as an LGBT person, fight picking at little battles. You're constantly telling your physio that you're gay. Or you're telling the school that the, the homework that they've sent has got that not inclusive of my family. So you just want to get to panel and you just want to get approved so to just to, to ask the assessing social worker to change gay to lower case might just be that bit too much for your lgbt applicants and they need you to be their allies here to be checking through and to be thinking wait a minute we can fix this here we've got a gay you wouldn't put a on the front they're gay 
Um, and then finally, they need, they need LGBT support. Often uh, the community get told that they'll, here's a referral or here's a mental health support service um, when we might not necessarily need it. Now, obviously it's important that we know these services exist. So it might be that you have a, a, a page on the website or you might be members of Pride to Be Parents, you might be members of New Family Social, for example. There's loads of different support services out there. It's important that we know about them, but it's not okay just to automatically think that they require a referral because they're LGBT. Okay, so moving on now. So we're gonna do the same kind of slide progression for trans terminology, okay? So this one is the one that people go away with usually thinking, ooh, I learned something there, or I need a little bit more on that. And again, you'll get all of the slides afterwards and you'll have a, a whole, whole slide with links. So don't worry or stress too much about not getting it right away. Okay, so gender identity, we all have one. If I asked you all to tell me right now, I'm sure you could confidently say, yes, this is who I am, this is my gender. So it's basically how you feel about your gender. And it's very unique and individual to each and every one of us, but often we're asked to assign a label to it because that's the way society likes to do. They like to give us labels and boxes up and you know, don't let us be the onions that we are with multiple layers and multiple ways in expressing ourselves. Gender expression is how we express that gender. And that is firmly entwined with the society in which we're living. Um, and it's and it based on societal and cultural norms of that gender as well. So that might be how we um, dress, how we wear our hair, whether or not we wear makeup, the type of shoes that we wear, um, nails, perfume choices, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that's how we express our gender. So we, we've got a gender, how we, how we feel that we are, and we also each have a gender expression, how we express that gender, which is entwined with societal expectations. Okay, so we all have that. So the next one is transition. Now often if I ask somebody to say, right, what does transition mean? Often people say it's changing from one gender to another, okay? And that is one of the biggest things I want you to take away as a total misconception around people's experiences of transitioning. There's, there's two different ways you can transition, socially and or medically. Um, and again, in a similar way to coming out, people think that transition is a one-off thing. It happens straight, like it's done, they're transitioned, they're now this. Um, and, and again, that's not the case. So some people, I mean, I've worked with young people who have transitioned just in the foster home and not at school, um, they've transitioned um, and then they've gone through a learning journey around language and self-expression and then use different terms as they're older and now into adulthood, they use different pronouns again. And they're on this almost lifelong journey of transitioning and that's okay. Some people may only transition socially. So that's changing the way that they might change their name and pronouns, for example. Um, they may change the way that they dress so that their gender expression aligns with their gender identity. Um, so, so that's an element of social transitioning. And then they may want to explore medical gender identity clinics, in which case there aren't many in England, um, in the UK. I think we've got some people from Scotland here, actually. Um, and yeah, so basically you would refer to adult gender identity clinic and there's over 80 gender affirming surgeries that people might want to have um, so basically remove that myth and stereotype that you have that there's there's one surgery have you had the surgery because that's a to total stereotype of trans people um, a transition is totally unique and individual to that person that you're working with whether it's a potential trans foster carer or already a trans foster carer. Um, so making sure that the assessments are person-centered is so important. There is a practice note that Cor and Baff have produced, practice note 69, um, called Assessing and Supporting Trans Foster Carers and Adopters. If you're ever working with a trans applicant, it'd be really important to get that. I think it's free to members. If not, I think it's like £2.50, it's like nothing. 
and it's so important just to it's got full of great resources um and it's been co-produced with trans people most importantly um really great resource okay um really important to note as well that not all trans people will have any medical transitioning and it's another myth that people think that you have to have some sort of medical interventions in order to be trans that's not true if someone says they're trans they are trans and we should accept them for who they are and support them through that journey okay um so it's yeah so it's really important another really important thing to know is that the most um most of the people that have gender affirming surgery are not from the trans community OK, so it might be women having breast augmentations, breast enlargement, breast reductions, for example. So um, often trans people that are, well, from what we've heard from the community is that they'll get asked questions about surgery, when actually the majority of people who get gender affirming surgery are not from the trans community. So if you're asking that question of a trans person, you should be asking it of everybody. OK, I, I, you know, if you've got plans for future surgery, you should be asking that of all your applicants. Um, and I would recommend you don't ask the question at all because it, it it's it's not relevant. Um, obviously, if you're assessing a, a, a trans a potential trans foster carer and they have plans or they're on a referral journey, they will talk to you about that anyway. Okay, because that would be part of the their assessment with you. Um, so gender dysphoria is a feeling of distress or discomfort because the way in which your body's developing and it doesn't in line with that that, that you identify with. Um, so people might utilise resources such as chest binders, for example. There's loads of different gender affirming resources. Uh, there's, there's no, I haven't got time to go through the whole list. But again, you'll have slides at the end that, that signpost out to other things. Often people panic and think, ah, oh, Binders, packers, body firmers, this all sounds risky. Being trans isn't a risk. It's really important to recognize that being a trans person is not a risk. Um, and these resources that people use are not risky either. Okay, so it's just a, another part of their clothing they use um, just to suppress that gender dysphoria and have that affirming experience um, for being who they are. Okay, so here we've got non-binary, and that's someone whose gender identity does not align with that of male or female. Um, so it just basically does not align with the binary construct of gender. Um, everybody, non-binary is very much an umbrella term with loads of different terms underneath it and within it, such as gender queer. There's, there's tons. That, I mean, I couldn't go through them all right now. This is a non-binary pride flag. Um, I think of some famous people now. My mind's gone blank. Sam Smith is non-binary um so and non-binary people may use gender neutral pronouns such as they and them and they may use a mixture of pronouns as well such as she and they or he and they for example and just ultimately with pronouns because sometimes people just get com com totally confused i mean elon musk put something completely transphobic out on twitter yesterday um basically if someone tells you that their pronouns are they and them, just accept it and use the pronouns they and them. Um, I, I always put my pronouns in my email signatures, in my Zoom name, um, because it's just a really inclusive way of saying, there you go, you won't get my gender uh, identity wrong. You won't get my pronouns wrong because I've, I've given you them. Um, and so if somebody is non-binary, you might make an assumption based on their appearance that they use she, her pronouns or he, him pronouns, and then we're misgendering people. So basically, utilizing pronouns wherever you can is really important because it's a really inclusive way of saying, I care enough about you getting my pronouns correct. So, and, and hopefully it me, means someone's more likely to share elements of their identity with you because you, you're putting that inclusive practice out there. Okay, cisnormativity is the assumption that everybody will grow up to be the gender that they were assigned at birth. So I was born, a doctor looked and went, congratulations, you've got a girl. So I was assigned. More and more, particularly in the collection um in 
input forms. You're going to be seeing Charlotte. this more. Yeah, Charlotte. Sorry, we we lost you then for a minute. Um, um, so um, if you could just go back like a couple of sentences because we we lost sound temporarily. No worries. So I was talking about cis normativity and how that is it, it's expected that you will be born and that you'll be assigned a gender at birth and that you'll grow up and continue and, and, and will be that gender you'll align with that gender so for example I was born they looked at me and said I'm a girl um, and I've grown up and I am a, a, a woman and I very much align with that identity okay so I was assigned female at birth so that means I'm cisgender now approximately 99% of the population are will hopefully have better statistics when the data from the census comes out because we're expecting that very soon and we'll have a, a, a clearer picture about how many um, members of the community are trans. Um, so that's this normativity, it's that expectation. And if you're not, then society just isn't built to support you well because you know, you've got male and female toilets everywhere, but where's the gender neutral toilet? Um, and there's a huge backlash around trans people at the moment, transphobic Twitter is rife. Um, and I'll talk a bit more about cis-normative examples in a moment. Here we've got intersex. This is the intersex pride flag. So someone who's born with sex characteristics that don't align firmly with um, male or female. Um, previously, the term hermaphrodite was used and that's completely outdated and should never be used. Um, so this is, this is intersex and this is the intersex pride flag. So we've talked about cisgender. So basically, um, if you're trans, your gender identity uh, is somewhat differ different to that that you were assigned at birth. Um, so trans is very much an umbrella term. So some, and there's loads of terms within that umbrella term as well. But within this presentation, the definition that we're using for trans is someone whose gender identity is somewhat different to that that they were assigned at birth. Again, don't worry about making notes because you do get these definitions afterwards, so don't worry or stress too much. Um, we talked about pronouns, and then here we've just got gen a bit about gender roles. So again, I, I was asked how, how we, could we describe our gender roles in our household during our assessment? And we really felt that we were being asked like to fit into gendered expectations, okay? Um, which are harm, you know, gender expectations are harmful to all in society. You just have to look at the suicide rates of young men. Um, so what, what we want to do is eradicate the idea that gender roles are important because, of course, roles are important. What we do in the household is really important to our caregiving capacity. Who, who, who does what in the house? Like they're important questions to ask, but to assume that people are going to sit into specific gendered expectations um, is harmful and it's harmful to the the people that you're assessing but it's also harmful to wider society as well. So here we've got some examples of um, cis normativity in practice so expecting people to look and act a certain way based on stereotypes again oh, I'd have never known do you, could you believe that they're trans they pass so well they don't look trans at all do they uh, and again that's down to the the stuff that we're being pushed in the media and tv um around what what trans people should look and act like okay if you put a line of 100 trans people you you, you you'd be surprised because the the picture that you've got around the stereotype that exists around trans people um is is so rife in the media being pushed through to us if you've got the time i really recommend you watch a documentary called disclosure on netflix produced by a trans woman and it gives you a picture of the way particularly that trans women have been portrayed in the media vilified um and it's really impacted the way in which society treats particularly trans women so i really recommend you watch that one again an over curiosity oh so when did you decide this what's your real name what were you born as totally inappropriate questions again go to that practice note, practice note 69, and I've got some inclusive language recommendations on the next slide. Transphobia does occur within, within social care. Oh, I can't place with them if they're trans, that's gonna harm the kids. I can't use those pronouns. I've had somebody say to me, well, I want you to refer to me as butterfly for the rest of the training session. Or, and I've had, I've had somebody within fostering say, well, I want you to call me queen from now on. 
these you know totally transphobic responses to us being inclusive uh, they can't progress unless they've had counseling we've got to be sure they aren't confused um and that's down to the lack of awareness of the person doing the assessment not knowing the experiences of trans, the trans community so you know we've got potential foster carers being paused and obviously you know we should pause people and until they're ready to move on to stage two but if it's down to that lack of awareness of the assessing social worker thinking oh I don't know what to do here they need counselling um then that's not acceptable um and it's not acceptable practice or seeing transition as a phase oh you're non-binary that's really trendy right now isn't it well actually no there's always been non-binary people it's just now we've got the language and the inclusive um more inclusive society to be the people that we are so it's just really important not to downplay it because it's not a, a trend no one would choose to be a member of the most marginalized community at the moment when you look at the outcomes of the, particularly mental health for tr the trans community so to put it down to a trend setting thing just really minimizes their experiences also thinking about input forms and policies so do you just have male and female boxes because that's not inclusive? Do you have an option for people to self-describe their gender? So if you are in those senior roles where you're auditing, you're looking at your policies, procedures, be thinking about the ways in which you can be more inclusive in that practice. And then there's also this fear of the well-being for people um, raised by trans people, which comes from myths and stereotypes and is not backed up by any kind of research base at all and um, but we do know that some people hold these viewpoints around trans people and I'll talk about research in just a moment so becoming an ally so we wouldn't say um he is transgendered or is a transgender we would just use the term transgender or trans if they're happy for it to be shortened um Again, he transgendered a few years ago. We should use the phrase transitioned. We don't use the term transgendered. He changed genders. Um, we shouldn't use that term. We would say he transitioned um, because what we know from the trans community is that they've always been the gender that they're saying that they are. It's just now that they're, they're telling you that. OK, so it's not a change of genders. They've always been that gender. We should use the phrase transitioned. Again, here's very similar when he was a boy before he became, uh, say when he was a girl before he became a boy, we would say when he presented as female, a girl before he transitioned. Again, really, I'm looking at those people who are reading form Fs or, or, or are writing them, thinking about the language that you're using. Um, being trans means you're gay. Many trans people might be gay. Um, but there's a there's a myth and stereotype that all trans people will be gay, lesbian, bi, pan, for example. Um, and I want you to go away today recognising that gender identity and sexual orientation are not the same. We all have a gender identity and we all have a sexual orientation, and that, but they're not the same thing. Did you get the surgery? I think I made that point on the previous slide. Um, some of you may want to have further discussions about that but we shouldn't ask about surgeries or private parts unless that a person explicitly invites that conversation. Uh, here we've got trans man, trans woman, all one word. So they're two separate words. We shouldn't be putting them all together as a word. We've got biological man slash woman. So we should use the phrase cisgender basically. Um, to use the phrase biological implies that to be a real man, you need to have been born and assigned male at birth, which is incorrect. So we use the phrase cisgender. Here we've got, he was born a girl, used to be a girl. And you've heard me say this phrase a couple of times now. We would say he was assigned female at birth. Um, and then here at the bottom, we've got it um, is a transphobic pronoun. So I'm just moving, I can just see pictures of people. I'm just moving thumbnails up. Um, and we, we, wouldn't use the term transsexual again unless the community member uses it to describe themselves there's loads loads more derogatory terms around the trans community that, that are, are used um but we which we should never use so there's a couple there um and then here we've got gender is dead some people have a response to you know talking about trans inclusion saying oh gender's dead you can't talk about gender anymore um, and that's not the case gender is really important to many people but Gender roles are not, and I've talked about that, gender roles are harmful to society. It impacts everybody, um, but gender itself is really meaningful to many.
Okay. Right, I want to now show you a video of the lived experience of the community. And then I've got a few slides to whiz through before we um, go into our breakout space, okay? So just bear with me as I stop the share and I'll share my video screen. I'm looking at Kay and Emma just to give me a thumbs up that it shares, okay? Can you see it? Yeah, we're good? Okay. So when we were being assessed for adoption, we were asked how we would describe our gender roles in the household. And we were a bit taken aback really because we felt that it was such a heteronormative thing to say. Gender roles really are based on stereotypical generalisations about what society expects from people who are perceived to be male or female. We certainly felt that a more appropriate question would be just simply, how do you describe your roles in the house? For us, really, it just felt that gender was irrelevant. I've been an independent panel member for numerous years and have heard various decorative comments over that time. Once an assessing social worker was asked prior to the couple coming in, tell us about the couple, what are they like? To which the social worker replied, well, I haven't seen them being gay together and then continued to talk about their relationship in a friendship based way. When we had completed our Form F, the agency decision maker came to the house to check in with us before we attended the panel. They talked us through the assessment and how they were confident about us being approved. They then went on to say that obviously being a gay male couple, we would be waiting longer for placements as children social workers were often concerned about placing children with, with male only carers. We were shocked. <laughs> really, by the by, the outright accepted discrimination um, and the fact that it was considered okay. The training provided was generally based around people becoming mum and dad and not parents. How can we feel included in the process if our identities are not reflected in the material we are being shown? Seeing our family set up not only shows us that the agency has thought about inclusion, but also gives us tips on navigating family life as an LGBT plus family. A couple of years ago, my manager came to me and said that they had a transgender adopter. They took them to a match up panel and the panel just totally dismissed them as they said it would be far too confusing for the child. I adopted my son as a single adopter. 
And my assistant social worker held up my folder, the file with my paperwork in, and said, when I got this folder on my desk as a single gay adopter in their early 30s, I put the meeting for the end of the day because I didn't think I'd be here very long and I didn't think there'd be much work to do because I don't think you'll be progressing to stage two. He didn't know anything about me other than four things and what we chatted about. It just felt a bit deflating to have been written off on the basis that I was a single gay man in my early 30s. Well, at Matching Power for our eight month old child, we were asked what we'd do if our child was bullied at school for having gay parents. We thought this type of question was out in the dark ages. However, we felt that we need to answer the question appropriately without showing our upset and our frustration to not jeopardise our match to our son. It took a lot for us to stay composed after this, as it was such a judgmental question. Okay, I'm always back to my slides now. Um, I love that video because I always say, you, if you just get a room full of lived experience in, uh, it's just so much better training and, and um, you know, just to, to hear it from them is so important. Again, so that video will be hyperlinked and you'll have access to that afterwards. So what does the research tell us then um, about the experiences of LGBT people? Well, for trans people, not much because there hardly is any research. There's only one piece of research that we know of to date in that's UK specific that looks at the experiences of uh, trans foster carers and adopters. And that was by uh, specifically Claire Brown in 2020. Um, and Claire Brown co-wrote the practice note 69 for, for Cora and Bath as well. Um, so that research showed us that non-binary people in particular reported feeling disproportionately disadvantaged by other people's perception of their gender and lack of awareness. We know that the voice of trans people is rarely included in research. Misgendering and negative reactions was common place um, from individual workers. And most agencies had little experiences of assessing and supporting. But it's really important to note that there are some really positive stories out there too. And the example, there are many more examples of growing knowledge and support. So if you want to learn more about trans awareness in child and family social work education, there's a great report by Nathan Hudson Sharp, which was produced by the Department for Education in 2018. Um, again, this handout will have a hyperlink to that. So you can read that a bit more and it's freely available online. Um, we know that cisgender norms that people are expected to conform to and when people don't conform they can be excluded and discriminated against again this was all research created by Claire Brown in 2020. Looking specifically um, at the well-being of people raised by trans parents we know from a very recent study that they show good quality relationships with their parents and good psychological well-being no matter when the parent transitioned okay so a social care practitioners we love to be backed up by research and and there it is you know children raised by trans um foster carers have good psychological well-being no matter when they transition so it's a really important piece of research there um there needs to be more research there needs to be more funding into trans experiences um we don't know enough about the experiences of trans foster carers specifically so we need to continue the work we also know that children raised in uh, um, lesbian, gay and bisexual families do as well as children raised by heterosexual couples. And a, mo a more recent study found um, that children with gay, lesbian and bisexual parents perform better at both primary and secondary education. And that was uh, studied by the University of Oxford in 2020. Um, and just a note that, and, I've, and I think I've, I've got my, um, you know, the energy out there on the previous slide about the void in, in research specifically looking at, at adoption and fostering by trans people can be deemed um, as an issue of equality and justice for trans people. Uh, and it's not changed much since 2018. Okay. So before we, we look at our, um, our breakout space, just some of the common assumptions, I think that we've already covered this anyway, uh, around gay men not having fertility issues, this heteronormative practice. Um, 
we've got here that there's high expectations placed on the, on the community because of the outcomes from that research. It's really important to recognise the impacts that might have on the community's mental health, for example. Um, and the, the presumed detrimental effects on children growing up with trans parents does remain widespread. And this is a social justice problem. Um, and it, it's transphobic. It's transphobic practice. And we should be recognising that. Some of the positives that uh, adoption fostering could be a first choice for many. Um, the, the resilience, resourcefulness, of navigating rejection, embracing difference from the LGBT families could be better placed supporting children with their identity, which is so important when we're working with uh, care experienced people. Um, and we know that contrary to lots of the stereotypes out there that um, children readily accept a range of genders and sexual orientations without confusion. It's like telling them that you've got a nose. They're like, all right, well, what's for my tea? <laughs> they really just don't mind. <laughs> Um, and just a, a last note about keeping children at the centre of decision making process. You know, I, I talked about me and my partner being asked about how we decided who would take the leave, but it wasn't a child centred question. So important to keep the child at the centre of the process, not the carer's LGBT status. And that comes down to our, oh, we're so curious about your relationship. How do you work? What does this mean? Um, making sure those questions are really relevant to the caregiving capacity. Also, Thinking about carers that have specific preferences for a particular gender or whether they're matched, only, you know, we're approved only for, for, for boys, for example, or for girls. What if the children that they are placed with are trans or are exploring their gender identity or don't um, have the gen, don't, don't fit into the gender roles that those carers are expecting? So it's important to talk to those carers about that before going through to panel to make sure that you've ironed out any potential transphobic, potential transphobic carers basically. Um, and that's why it's so important to explore the perspective, foster carers own views of LGBT identities. Are they homophobic? Are they transphobic? You won't know unless you ask the question. It's really important to ask, how would you support a, a gay child who comes out in your care? and it can be really clear from their response about whether or not you need to do a bit more work with them before they go through um, for any further through the assessment. Okay, so what we should be looking for. So here we've got side one, we've got equality. If we treat everybody the same, then we are inevitably excluding some people. So in EDI world, we talk a lot about equity, that's fairness, putting in resources in building blocks to make sure that everybody has access. So that might be providing a gender neutral toilet, making sure that when you book a space for panel, does it have a gender neutral toilet? Are you thinking equality when you're working through the projects that you're, you're doing? So doing these constant, I call them little mini equality impact assessments, thinking about how your decisions impact the community. Do we need to buy in resources? Do we need to do some extra work? But what we really should be having is services built with liberation, belonging at the heart. And that's what we want really, is to not even have to put the building blocks in in the first place. We should already be thinking, there isn't a gender neutral toilet here, so we won't use this space again. Okay, so I'm trying to keep to time. You can see Kay and Emma just thinking, how is she gonna do this? <laughs> how is she gonna get through it all? Um, for the next 10 minutes, we're gonna put you into breakout rooms. I'm hoping that Uh, yeah, I hope that you found that really informative. I, I often like to jump in the room to see what the discussions are taking place, but I, I steer clear so I didn't put anyone off. I did go easy on you actually reading these back. I think I could have thrown a few curveballs in there um, and a couple of these I've already discussed in the session already. Um, so if a couple of, uh, if anybody from groups want to just put a couple of reflections on the key points that were discussed in your breakout spaces, please put those in the chat because Emma and Kay might pull those out for resources that are produced in future. Um, and yeah, just your insights there will be really valuable. So please just take a couple of minutes whilst I was through these um, scenarios to do that in the chat. Uh, and then after the scenarios, we'll have time for a little Q&A. Okay. So you notice that an LGBT identity of an applicant is written incorrectly on the paperwork. A really simple response to that is to talk to the assessor talk to the social work worker, whoever it is that was the author of that piece of work, to talk to them about inclusive language um, and just making sure that they're getting that right. And But if, it, if that continues as an ongoing problem, that may be down to someone's lack of, uh, lack of acceptance of a person's identity, then that might be a practice-based issue. 
um, that would need further work, further training, for example. We've got there a non-binary applicant is misgendered by the assessor during panel when the applicant's out of the room, um, but uses the pronouns that the applicant wants to use in the room, for example. So we would be correcting them there. It might be a one-off mistake, um, in which case we correct them and crack on. But again, if it's a continued error and that it's ongoing and it's over a longer period of time, then we, we can be pulling that up as a practice issue as well. Um, because it's okay to get it wrong once or twice. We all make mistakes. It's part of being a good ally is to work through that. Um, you know, I, I've worked with LGBT people before who have come out as trans and I got it wrong. You know, I've worked with them for 10 years using a particular pronoun and it was like muscle memory, it came out. And it was at that point I went, wait a minute, I need to do the work. I need to be getting this right um, and reflecting on that and making sure we get it right. Uh, so a panel member asked the question, how do you decide who would take the maternity leave to two female applicants at panel? I think that we covered that one already because that was the personal one for me. Um, yeah, just ask questions that are relevant to the caregiving capacity and making sure that it's not about your over curiosity about LGBT people, about how LGBT people live their lives. Um, a gay couple are told by a social worker to expect to wait a long time to be linked slash matched with children due to them being gay. So this is really super um, heteronormative practice. Um, some people may be shaking their heads thinking no one would ever say that to, to families, but a couple of my close friends who are foster carers have had that exact thing happen to them. Um, and it's really, you know, it's really important to recognise that Section 28 wasn't that long ago. Section 28 piece of legislation that basically said you couldn't talk about LGBT people having pretend family relationships. Uh, and it was only in 2003 that LGBT people could ad adopt. Um, so it's really important to recognize that this, you know, these pieces of legislation have had a real hangover on uh, in, in, in to social care um, and lots of people still experience um, homophobic language like that in their experiences in fostering. Um, an LGBT couple did not feel included in the training materials provided to them. My recommendation would be to utilize the community. Say, we want to look at our training. We want to speak with our LGBT community, your LGBT foster carers, for example. Um, and you, know, you might put a, a call out to staff. You might say, we'd really like to talk to LGBT staff. Don't just go to them and say, oh, you're gay. You can help us with the training. Put it out there as an opportunity say does anybody want to be involved in this working group or this project that we've got going on co-produce it that's always going to create the best outcomes if you co-produce things with the community um a panel member raises concerns about a match with a girl and how her needs would be met in a male-only household it's really important to work through whether that concern is about them being gay and work through that with that professional and whether there is real matching considerations there okay so it's really important that we, we are aware of that in social care because I, I've experienced this in the organization that I work for um, and in that instance it was about the social workers lack of understanding and awareness about how um, and, and misconceptions around gay, gay men and their caregiving capacity okay so we recommended that that person go on further training um, here we've got a social worker has concerns about matching with a trans carer due to worries about any future surgery having impact on the stability of the placement. Um, and I think I made my point clear earlier on that the most most people who have gender affirming surgery are not trans. OK, so if you're having these concerns about matching with a trans carer, you should be having these concerns about matching with any carer because any carer could go on to have a gender affirming surgery. Um, or any surgery and we, we know that things happen as the carers have accidents or they need a new bit knee or whatever else it is and you work through that with your backup carers or with whatever respite options you have available so just be thinking about is this about me and my lack of awareness of trans people or is it actually a relevant question okay so I hope that I've got that point across there um, okay, so just some recommendations to take away before a very short Q&A. Sorry, Emma, um, but at least we will have a couple of questions time. Um, so take today as a seed to continue the learning. Um, Recognise your own biases. We haven't had time to go through unconscious bias and hopefully 
there will be some more um, webinars in the future uh, um, uh, specifically around that topic. And um, we haven't even touched on the term intersectionality, which recognizing all the different layers of identity and how they impact the ways in which we communicate and work with people. Take homophobia, biphobia, transphobia seriously, including that banter, those microaggressions, the little things that people seem to think are acceptable, that gossip in the, the staff room. Take it seriously because it's homophobia, it's LGBT phobia, and it has no, no place in the workplace. Um, ensure assessments recommendations are free from the heteronormative and cisnormative assumptions, and we talked about a few examples in the slides. Remembering what matters the child, not the carer's LGBT status. Make information available, be that on your website or a server, wherever it is you, that you have your signposting stuff, you know, have your LGBT specific stuff on there. Be prepared to learn a new language. You're all going to go away thinking, what was that term that I learned? I didn't know that was a pride flag. Goodness me, there's so many different flags. Um, go away and yeah, learn some more because you'll be better practitioners for it. Um, create an atmosphere of acceptance and inclusion, so important. And it's also really important to understand the impact of oppression. We didn't have time to go through the stats on the LGBT community, and that's why we'll be doing more of these in the future, just to, just to give you a picture of the, the, the really bleak picture of, of, of the oppression of LGBT people at the moment. Importance of visible role models and allyship, you know, those badges that I was talking about. And I'd love to see a pride flag on every foster carer's fridge. It's my goal in life. A pride flag, so simple, on every foster carer's fridge will tell every child that comes into that home, oh, I can be gay here and that's okay. Um, so yeah, really just so, sign and symbols are so important. As an LGBT person myself, if I go into a space that's got a pride flag, I can instantly be out and proud in those spaces. It's so important. Building positive relationships is key. Um, don't make assumptions based on stereotypes that we're aware of and that goes back to your unconscious bias. Address the banter. And really I'm talking to the people here who create the policies and procedures and audit them. Don't just download it and put 2023 on actually read it and look through and think, can we talk to the community about making this better? Are we getting the terms right? Have we got up-to-date resources in there? Because they're so important because it tells your workforce, this is the blueprint that we need to work from. Um, and so that's why it's so important to have those there. Okay, and we do have a few minutes for a Q and A. I know a couple came through um, on the chat, so I'll... If ever, if you let me know what they were. I think someone mentioned something about the lesbian pride flag and why it doesn't include the black and brown colours. Really good question. Um, that's just one of the lesbian pride, pride, pride flags. I don't know why we've got more than one. Um, so there's a whole host of them. Um, and it's it's much less, it's, it's not used as much as the gay pride flag, basically. So um, I'm sure one does exist with all of those colours as well. Um, I'd have to do a little bit of research. Um, I don't know everything, unfortunately, but um, yeah. So basically, it, it, as far as I know, it's on the the all inclusive pride flag is the one that we should be using. Um, but there's a whole host of different um, lesbian pride flags. I think that one's for femme lesbians. There's like a butch lesbian pride flag. There's a whole host of them. Honestly, there's so many. <laughs> Thank you, Charlotte. So shall I tell you one of the other questions yeah. that came in? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So somebody asked, would everyone who is transitioning be assessed as having gender dysphoria or are these separate things? No, again, so that's another misconception that it, some, some may. Um, I, I mean, we don't have the time to go through the routes to people getting a gender identity certificate it's called a GIC. Lots of trans people might go through that route to get a GIC, but it's really super intrusive and takes over two years. Um, and if you're married, you have to have the consent of your spouse as well. So if they say that you can't go through that process then they can't so that's another like legal barrier to trans people having their gender affirmed self-declaration would be the best thing and if someone says that they are trans they don't need a gender identity certificate as proof like they just don't need that they're uh, protected under the equality act they can say that this is who i am um yeah so it's you shouldn't just assume that everybody who is trans has gender dysphoria um it, it's again it's person-centred, person-specific.
Okay, thank you. Um, so then another question that came in um, was around skills to foster training. And someone was saying, does skills to foster training reflect the LGBTQ plus experience? Because, and the point they were making is that that first foster, that first training that foster carers do is obviously really important. Um, I feel like I should have the answer to this question as well. My sense is that that's gonna be variable. Um, I don't know, Charlotte, if you've got a kind of different different answer to that. Yeah, and I think that it's a train the trainer model, isn't it? And if you're a trainer who is been trained to do the training and uh, doesn't have the skills and awareness of the LGBT community, then it can't be truly reflective because obviously they you know, you need them to deliver the skills to foster training in an intersectional way to be thinking about the ways in which this scenario could impact the LGBT community. What about this scenario? How's that impacting the black community? Are we thinking about this when we're matching? Are we talking about matching um, LGBT children? Are we really widening our horizons in the delivery? And that comes down to the trainer and the experience of the trainer. So it might be something to reflect back on and to look and think, is that delivered in the train the trainer model? And that might be something that Corin Baff can look back on. I don't know, I don't deliver the skills to foster training. So, um, but I think that it really comes down to ultimately having a diverse workforce and you know looking back at are you members of the recruitment teams do you are you really look around you are you recruiting because it, this was your friends that, that you were a social you trained to be a social worker with at uni or are you actually thinking we need to be more diverse we need a more diverse social work team we need a more diverse foster care base because if we all look the same then we're not going to be as inclusive as we need to be in in our practice because we need as many voices as possible to get it right absolutely and someone's put in the kind of following on from the first the first part of your answer to that question someone's put in the chat about going back through training through materials checking terminology looking at how we kind of update and revise because we will have all sorts of training all sorts of information all sorts of resources websites foster carer handbooks and so on that we all use, but there's absolutely nothing to say that we can't update, revise, skill ourselves up, share this information more widely. Um, on which note, a few people have kind of put in, uh, asked whether we're gonna be doing more in this area. Absolutely, yes. I think um, from our point of view in Coram Bath, and I can see lots of people nodding, it feels like we've got a lot more to learn, a lot more to kind of um, share a lot more to kind of skill ourselves up with. So our plan, our hope is that Proud To Be Parents um, will continue to want to work with us going into the new year. I think I, I think we've hopefully got that <laughs> relationship yeah. cemented, yeah. that's a yet. There's some really interesting things come out through the chat. I don't think we've got time to go through everything, but someone saying about asylum seeking child who didn't want to be placed with a gay couple. Yeah, yeah. you know, that, that's, you know, it's really important to recognize what local community groups can support there because there will be organizations that you can tap into that can support that child to raise their awareness of the lgbt community you know so there's there's work that can be done and there's also and um, there's a great charity called um the proud trust specifically in the northwest but they cover nationwide and we've worked with them to support birth families as well who have got issues with their children being placed with LGBT families. Um, so you can, you know, it's really important that we do the work with the birth families too. So, but what community resources are you linking in with to do that? Because a social worker might not be the best person to do it. It might be an outreach youth worker who can go out and say, well, you know, we've, we've worked with families who have had, you know, who, who have rejected their children because of them being LGBT. And you, they can go out and do some work and support, you know, and 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 that's what we want. That's what we need is we need to know what resources can we tap into, what local community resources can we tap into to to support you to do that work. I don't know. If I any think that's the, that's the point, isn't it, Charlotte? That if you don't feel like you've got enough knowledge yourself, you become aware of a situation like that one that you've just explained. Then there will be organisations, hopefully locally, but if not nationally. Where you can go and kind of get that information lots of people are saying can we have more of this yeah. um and people wishing that more people in their teams and colleagues would would also like to attend so we will take that all on board um 
Are there any things? Uh, I, there were a few more comments, but it's I think people are mainly now. Um, yeah, just asking if there's going to be more. I think that the answer's. That's the main thing, isn't it? There is a question about consensual monogamy and future research. That feels like quite a big kind of question that I'm not sure we can kind of get into right here, right now, given that we were meant to finish four minutes ago. But I suppose that and any other questions, queries that we've not covered, like we've said, we'll, we'll be doing more of these. Um, and if there's anything really specific that you kind of really need an answer to because you need it to help with practice, then please either get in touch with our events team um, through Kay and she will forward that to relevant people within um, Cor and Bath and we can make contact with Charlotte, obviously, or come through our advice line. Um, if there's any particular queries around practice that you need some help on. And again, if we don't have the answers internally within Cor and Bath, we work with colleagues like Charlotte and Matt um, and others who will help us out. So I, I think... I do apologise that I wished through a lot, but I was trying to get through as much as I can in 90 minutes just to make so much good use of your time. <laughs> so Charlotte, do you think, is that a good moment for us to draw to a close? I think so, yeah. Yeah, so what um, Kay's just popped in the chat, you can share the training materials, but but just within kind of your, your small working teams, is that right, Charlotte? Because actually what we want people to do is to be able to come along to training and kind of hear it and then have the opportunity to ask questions if there's bits they don't understand. Yeah, and if you want to come direct to Proud to be Parents to commission a piece of training within your own organisations, then that's absolutely fine. It'd be very similar to what I've delivered today, but less of me talking at 100 miles an hour and more breakout spaces, basically. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Charlotte. Um, there's lots of thank yous coming in in the chat. Really brilliant to see you all. Remember that we continue to run our Exploring Expertise webinars. So have a look out for those and please do sign up for anything that kind of piques your interest or you think you might need to learn a bit more about. And yeah, Charlotte, it's been absolutely awesome. Whistle stop tour, but brilliant. Thank you loads. No problem at all.